Welcome to the 2021 International Women's Day Virtual Summit, a visionary women production in association with Women Moving Millions, Acumen, and Vital Voices. Presented by Maurice and Paul Marciano and media partner, The Wall Street Journal. To start things off, please welcome two of our visionary leaders. Welcome to the Visionary Women 2021 International Women's Day Summit, a global vision for a better future. My name is Angela Nazarian. And my name is Lily Bossi. We are two of the co-founders of Visionary Women. Visionary Women is a unique nonprofit community of women dedicated to improving the lives of women and girls and funding on a global basis, high impact initiatives. Visionary Women has become the premier platform for the exchange of ideas, featuring some of the world's major thought leaders and change agents. It is our sincere pleasure to welcome you to our first virtual celebration of International Women's Day. Today, Visionary Women has joined with three change-making organizations that are a force on the national and international stage, Acumen, Women Moving Millions, and Vital Voices. Our joint initiative of this summit has given us the opportunity to cast our message far and wide, and that message is, there is incredible power in the sisterhood of women joining together. Our collective voices can and will generate change for the betterment of women today. There will be three separate panels. Each panel will be discussing the most important issues we face in today's complicated world. Equity, peace building and unity, and how to get there. We hope that these conversations spark learning, reframe some questions, increase collaborations, and ultimately lead you to tap into your power for more inspired solutions. We are at a time in history when the challenges are great, but the possibilities have never been greater. Now to kick off our program, we would like to introduce you to the fierce leader, friend, and change maker who happens to be the Executive Director of Women Moving Millions, Sarah Hackey Bird. Thank you, Angela and Lily, for holding space today for this important and timely conversation. It is a great honor to be celebrating International Women's Day with visionary women, vital voices, and acumen, organizations which are all doing incredible work to advance the rights of women globally. Each of us share in the goal of amplifying women's voices and highlighting the message of equality, togetherness, and peace on this very special day. We are unified in our commitment and vision of a gender equal world. At Women Moving Millions, we work to achieve this vision by amplifying the voices and leadership of women who are on the front lines of the movement for equality. At the heart of our approach is to convene leading women philanthropists who each make a bold million dollar commitment to women and girls alongside movement leaders and activists so that together we can accelerate progress towards gender equality. Our community of 340 members are some of the most engaged, purposeful, and powerful philanthropists of our time. Together, we have mobilized more than $800 million for women and girls, including nearly $100 million since the launch of our Give Bull, Get Equal campaign in September. I am so Honored, excited to introduce today's conversation, Vision for Equity, with two women who are each moving millions for a gender equal world, Jacqueline Novogratz and Pat Mitchell. Founder and CEO of Acumen and best-selling author, Jacqueline is the embodiment of vision. For nearly two decades, Acumen has been changing the way the world tackles poverty by investing philanthropic capital in companies and leaders with character, competence, and moral leadership. Acumen has invested $135 million in companies providing critical goods and services to more than 270 million low-income people across the globe. Now, Pat. Over the course of her storied career as a journalist and pioneering media executive, Pat has created a body of award-winning work as a national news reporter and anchor and as the creator and producer of documentaries, many of which focus on women's stories, challenges, and accomplishments. Pat is the editorial director of TED Women, 
chair of the Sundance and the Women's Media Center Boards and trustee of the Acumen Fund. Her recent book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, Embracing Risk to Change the World, is a must read for all of us seeking to transform the world for good. As we convene today, women are continuing to bear the brunt of the pandemic, impacting their health, safety, and opportunity. Today's timely conversation is centered around uplifting women and driving economic prosperity. I hope you find inspiration from our panelists on how each of you can be part of the positive change we need to ensure women move from crisis to recovery to thriving. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thanks to the amazing team at Visionary Women. Um, thank you, Angela Nazarian, you are extraordinary. And um, Pat Mitchell, it is just wonderful to be here in conversation um, in with you about what it means to build a more economically integrated economy, specifically when it comes to women. And I can't think of a better person to kick this off, Pat, you've been a a mentor, a friend to me, and frankly, to my generation. In your incredible book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, which I encourage everyone to read, you really lay out some of the, the massive obstacles in, in your way and in the way of women of your generation. And, um, and first, I just wanna say thank you from mine um, for all the work that you did do. And then I just wanna ask if you would talk a little bit about what that meant for you as a woman who wanted to work, wanted to contribute, um, and how it impacted the way then you have focused on removing barriers for other women. Thank you, Jacqueline. I look forward to any opportunity to have a conversation with you on Zoom in person or in any other way, um, because we share a, a very special friendship. And as you know, my women friends are what I call my renewable source of energy and inspiration. <laughs> so I'm feeling particularly energized and inspired today to be with you and all of the women uh, who are joining us today. As we found out early on, even though we come from very different generations and places in the world. Not so different. <laughs> pretty different, but we had things in common. One of them is that we both grew up in military families. We both grew up with a lot of resources. And I recognized very early on that if I wanted to have a different kind of life than the one I was seeing around me, I was going to have to work hard uh, and get an education. Certainly, um, I saw limitations and expectations for girls growing up in the South, small town Georgia in the 50s, and I didn't want that life. So I went about as, as we all do, finding ways to work, finding ways to get scholarships, finding ways to, uh, to find paths out of the limitations and expectations. And then during my university experiences, two great social justice movements had begun, the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement. And so I became very early on activated, uh, engaged, and social justice and equality became a part of what mattered most to me and what I had to learn to do, as most of us do, is how to integrate that need to be involved in uh, change and making change and also sustaining a life for myself and my son as a single mm -hmm. mom. Uh, teaching gave me a sense of impact and engagement. I love my college teaching years. But when I found an opportunity to go into media, to television, um, I saw a whole new platform for impact and to take my social justice concerns, my concerns for creating different kinds of opportunities for women and girls than I had experienced. But I wanna say too, that that opportunity for me to go into television was the result of a change in policy, government policy in that case, the Equal Employment Act gave television and all media actually a mandate 
and, and even a sort of quota system to hire women and people of color. So sometimes we can do all we can individually and we'll still hit a barrier that will need policy or law changes. And so uh, I'd like to you know, think about that as we think about integrating uh, economic systems for greater prosperity for all. And I'd like to hear your story, more of it, Jacqueline. Well, I love it. And, and what's so interesting, and, and it's you know the brilliance of Angela to put us together, Pat, because you know, you're really talking about telling the stories that matter as part of economic integration and the policies, um, almost the social determinants that are required so that women can be in the workforce and be fully active in the workforce. And so I do wanna come back to that um, because we are going through a period with the pandemic when just in the United States alone, 25% of women have left the workforce. Um, my path is similar, as you said, in that I grew up eldest of seven in a military family and, and work was just so fundamental to everything that I did. And I think I learned from a very early age as a you know, seven or eight year old paper girl um, to a 10 year old neighborhood babysitter uh, to a waitress and a bartender and a store manager and everything else that you do. Uh, that work and the income that came from work uh, provided me with a level of freedom, uh, security, and I dare say confidence um, from a very early age. And it was almost the only thing I, I did know. What I didn't understand was the tools of markets that could actually um, enable others. And my first job, as you know, was as an as a international banker. And, and and there I started to see these powerful tools and understand the stories that numbers could tell. I also saw, particularly in places like Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, that um, low-income people and specifically women had no place in the banks. They weren't welcome in the doors, uh, nor did they have the confidence to interact. And that set me off really on my life's work. I moved to Rwanda. I co-founded the nation's first microfinance bank back in 1986. And there actually, Pat, policy also played a very important role. Before 1986 in Rwanda, women could not open a bank account without their husband's permission and signature. Uh, they were put in the same category as women, as um, children and the mentally impaired. Um, and so to build a bank in that moment really was the marriage of good policy and economic opportunity. But even there, I also saw that markets weren't enough. That while we could provide access to women through these tiny loans, many of them didn't have the capabilities nor the confidence to interact with markets. And so um, I started my own little company with 20 women bakers um, and we cornered the snack food market, but again, I saw how much time it took to coach and build and provide the capabilities that allowed us um, to succeed in that way. And that the, the results of that work were also not just the results that you could measure. It was finally the ability to say no. It was the confidence to hold one's head up it was probably what I learned most of all through that work and it has been reinforced over and over for these 35 years, which is that we think about poverty as a lack of income or wealth, but really poverty is a lack of dignity. It's a lack of choice, it's a lack of opportunity, it's a lack of freedom. And that really is what led me to starting Acumen now uh, almost 20 years ago. And the other, only other thing I would say is that incredible women like you, Pat, have accompanied me and, and you served on my board for, for nine years and that none of us do this alone. And I think that's where women have a real advantage because we understand that in our core. You know, I believe, as you know, Jacqueline, that stories are our bridges to each other, to cross divides, differences of opinion. Um, it's the way that we understand how each other's lives are connected mm. and how we are connected. 
and bigger struggles to create bigger opportunities. And uh, it's been my experience that working with women um, in, in providing opportunities for women to realize their own potential and to pursue the more equal opportunities is just the most satisfying work that I've ever uh, been involved in. And when I wrote the book, which you referenced earlier, um, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, the first thing I had to do was redefine dangerous because having been a reporter in war zones, I wanted to be sure I wasn't uh, referring that people didn't think I was referring or in any way being frivolous about women who live with ever present danger every day yeah. of their lives. Um, we all, we've seen those women, we know them and we know their pain uh, and fear. The kind of dangerous that I am referencing is the dangerous that makes you incredibly effective as a change maker. And there is no question that we need change in the world and that much of that change um, can come about when women connect to each other and work together. So I define dangerous essentially as being willing to take the risk and you took a risk, many risk in your life. And by the way, you must read Blue Sweater to understand all the risks that Jacqueline took as a young woman in Rwanda. But we've taken risks to create new ideas or innovate um, because we knew that was the way to change. So if you're willing to take the risk, here are the three things that I found were common among every woman I talked to who I considered a change maker. And you're one of the women profiled in the book. Being willing to speak up. Speak up about injustice every time we see it, experience it, witness it, speak up about it, and then do something to end injustice. Showing up for one another. That mm -hmm. may be, in my opinion, the most dangerous thing we can do. Because we've been socialized as women to compete, to compare, to never feel quite enough uh, in every part of our lives. And being able to get past that own internal barrier, but then the external barriers to reach across divides to each other. And to collectively problem solve, to look to each other as sources of energy, inspiration, um, mm. commitment to change. So that is possibly the most dangerous thing we can do. And as someone uh, reminded me that, you know, the uh, we're, we're dangerous only to the people who want to hold on to power and status quo, because they realize that women working co collectively together particularly older women, by the way, I just have to put in a word for our generation. Um, older women are not only among the fastest growing populations on earth, but we are among the most dangerous. <laughs> we, we have less to lose. Uh, we're ready to take more risk and to stand up, speak up and show up. Uh, and those are the elements needed for change. I love that, Pat. I'm going to ask you another question. Just follow quick follow up question because um, you've sparked so many thoughts in my my head, and that is um, you mentioned taking on the status quo, being dangerous, and this community is largely a community of women philanthropists. And when I started Acumen twenty years ago, philanthropy was much a much more comfortable sector. Um, it was very hard to tell people who were philanthropists that they were doing anything incorrectly with their uh, money and um, and now we see a new generation that are looking at philanthropy as a tool for change and that requires the willingness to be uncomfortable and and right now particularly in the United States where we're hardly talking to each other across lines of difference um, there are ample opportunities to be uncomfortable and I wonder as you know as I've watched you um, not only have you fought for principles you deeply hold, but you found a way to do so um, while bringing other people along to move some of these policy changes. And I wonder if there's just something you can share about, about some of either a story or a lesson there in um, where you've taken an unlikely uh, adversary and helped them become an ally. It's such a good question, Jacqueline, because 
We have never needed allies more um, in the world and we have never needed to feel allied with each mm. other. So uh, I think the one that's most present for me right now is the work I'm doing um, with a group of uh, connected women leaders. And this was an idea uh, that is based on everything I believe in, which is if we connect women together, no matter how different their paths are, what ge divided by geographies, divided by work, divided by all the things that keep us separate from each other, but bringing them together and giving them problems to solve, saying, you know, we need this planet to be sustainable. So let's start with climate. We need to know that food's going to be available. We cannot have the numbers of people with food insecurity that exist in this world today. What can we as women leaders do to resolve that? Economic inequity, there must be a path to build. I don't, I don't believe we're trying to build back better, by the way. I believe we're trying to build forward better. And we can do that if we do it together. Women absolutely that. have to play a role in the economic recovery. So just to use one quick example, I brought together these 40 women leaders from all kinds of sectors, government, education, nonprofit, uh, social enterprises. And we said, OK, we have four days. We're going to come up with four ways to solve climate. And they're going to be under the rubric or under the idea of climate justice. And in four days, these women, not climate experts, but led by a couple of women who were, came up with the Declaration on Climate Justice that was signed by 700 world leaders and will go in to COP, uh, the next climate meeting. Um, so every time we get together, we choose a problem and we dive deep, we learn what we can learn, we learn from each other, and then we collectively decide to get past our differences and come up with solutions. You know, when I was working in Rwanda, you know, 25, 26, 27 year old, 28 year old, um, I remember my friend Charles de Brabant saying to me once, you know, you're so political. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, he said, well, you know, all you do is talk about how this has to change for women. And I was like, let me, let me help you understand something. Every time Landrada gets behind the, the wheel of a car, that's a political act. Every time. Uh, we get a, a loan to a woman um, and her priest says that she shouldn't have that loan because we're charging interest and interest is forbidden. That's a political act. So I am not ideolo ideological, my friend, but this is about change. And many men would stop me in the streets and say, you know, you're ruining our women. And I had to figure out a way to bring them in because they were the policymakers. They were the guys that had the money that I needed so that we could build the bank. And so I think I had to learn a lot of those skills early. And when we started Acumen Patent, if you'll indulge me, I'll just talk a little bit about the model. Um, it was not, again, it wasn't driven by ideology. And in fact, I never knew what it would appeal more to the left or to the right, because it starts with a fundamental belief in markets um, that markets actually do release real energy, particularly in, in communities that have always been controlled by other people. And if you wanna see a community like that, go to a community of the poor because everybody has their hands in the lives of the poor. Not only the slum lords and the political leaders and the religious leaders, but the family structures that always keep women last. And so understanding that meant finding a way to give them voice and real opportunity I also had seen the limitation of markets um, right from the early days of Wall Street where the poor can be too often exploited, the poor can be too often overlooked. And so Acumen tried to bring those two forces together, first with this idea of patient capital, that we would take philanthropy, which should be the most risk-oriented capital we have, but it's where we too often see the least amount of risk and we would invest for 10 to 15 years, which was another rule breaker of philanthropy because so often we're short-term oriented and change is about the long-term. Um, we would accompany our entrepreneurs using not just our financial capital, but our social capital, our networks, our, our access, so that we could help bring other kinds of resources to those entrepreneurs to solve problems of water, healthcare, education, energy, agriculture, we would measure what mattered. 
the impact on people's lives. And we would hold ourselves accountable to getting our money back so that we could invest in other entities. And the hypothesis was 20 years ago that we would, we'd see these outsized results. And as you know, because you were a board member, indeed we have 300 million people having access to um, these critical goods and services. What I think we forget too often, and I think this is the opportunity of all of our broken systems in America and elsewhere, is that when you focus the right kind of capital on the right character in service of solving a problem and you surround it with the right community, not only can we, change, we, can we solve that problem, but we do so in a way that creates jobs and other opportunities. And, and, and I would just give one example with a solar company started by two guys actually, um, but who had a deep level of what I would call the immoral imagination that they, they saw the mess of the world they were in, but they never lost sight of what they were going to build. They were incredible listeners and they saw low-income people as customers who deserved to have their trust earned, something that's also in short supply these days. And, um, and by seeing that women typically and all poor people relied on kerosene as their only form of light and energy, they knew that they had to convince people to stop using that kerosene and make a decision, which is very difficult to buy um, a newfangled technology, solar electricity back in 2007. And it took a long time. It's, we've been in that company now for almost 14 years. And yet that single company has reached 100 million people with light and electricity. You wanna change a woman's life? Get her electricity and get her off of using an inefficient cook stove with wood or kerosene or kerosene for her lighting because 36% of all respiratory disease is connected to these dirty fuels. You wanna change a woman's life, get her electricity because the, the jobs that have been created have at least, you know, at least 40% of them have been women's jobs and they're not dead end jobs. They are career paths. And I have met so many of the women agents that um, are not only empowered in the way that they've changed their lives, but they see that they are, they are working on, a, on solving one of their nation's great problems. And that brings a, a renewed level of confidence. And so um, I really think that this is a moment in some ways almost to move from our high level in the way that we talk about our health systems and our education systems and our daycare systems and find those entrepreneurs. And right now in the United States, there are many women and back them with our philanthropy, with our investment capital, um, with our social capital, because they are breaking the patterns and the status quo, which as you said, requires um, a lot of hard, a lot of long and a lot of partnership. And, and that's what this moment demands of all of us. Jacqueline, you, you made reference to something very much on all our minds, which is um, the need to bridge differences in this country, to heal our divides and to find ways as women in particular to come back together, uh, to be the change agents we know we can be. Can you talk a bit more about that? How do you see the path forward there? Thanks for asking that, um, Pat. And, and it actually is connected to why we started Acumen Academy in the first place, because you know, I started Acumen with thinking that, that finance and access to long-term patient capital was the answer. And then I realized we were working in so many conflict-ridden nations. And we, by definition, our businesses had to develop the skills of crossing lines of difference. And as, as you know better than anyone, I grew up with Rwanda. Um, having started a bank before the genocide and then discovering that many of the, the women I loved ended up on opposite sides of the genocides, being murdered, uh, being bystanders, uh, being perpetrators. And what I learned through that experience is that there are no such thing as good people and bad people, angels and monsters, but we have angels and monsters living in every single one of us. And that what's hard in times of insecurity is that demagogic types of leaders can prey on our 
insecurities and fears are broken parts and cause us to blame each other, cause us to get divided and fear each other and sometimes make us do terrible things. And so this is deeply personal to me. And I, I think what I've learned in working in some of the most conservative or traditional areas of the world for poor people and women and minorities. Um, and as I said, in conflict areas, Co Colombia after 50 years of civil war, is that the way into the difficult conversation starts by acknowledging a truth or even a partial truth in what the other side says and almost opening up a space um, to acknowledge that you're listening. And it doesn't mean giving up your principle. It means acknowledging that there's something to learn from each other, listening from a place of inquiry, not from certainty. And you know, I love the Sufis. And one of my favorite Sufi sayings is that out beyond right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. But, but I wanna move to privilege because what you've done and what I've learned from you on so many levels is that you've used the privilege of your platform then to be the person to take those kinds of stories, to take those kinds of individuals that the world never gets to hear about and bring them to a larger audience. And this is also a moment in our history where I hear so many people saying, check your privilege, hide your privilege. And, um, or we feel so guilty about our privilege that it can freeze us. And I wonder, I wonder where that comes from and what a message would be as we think about the community of philanthropists. How do we use our privilege better from the work that you do? Well, um, it's such a big question. Uh, and I would begin by saying that the first thing we do is we, we reset our values. Um, so I'm going to just do a shout out for uh, the Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, uh, Jacqueline's new book, because it reminds us that at the basis of everything, we have to be doing it for the right reasons. We have mm -hmm. to have those values. And acumen is testimonial, as you've just proven that the, you know, the power of, of our resources, our money, our, our minds, our, all of it to, uh, to put into the hands of women leading. Now, to your question about the times, I mean, what, how do you do this? One of the things that we had to get past, you with your um, skeptics who were saying, you're always talking politics, Jacqueline, to my um, more corporate experiences where I would be in a corporate boardroom and someone would say, don't play the women's card, intimidating us not to put women forward for the board seats, or don't play the race card when you're looking to promote a person of color. Well, you know, my feeling now and why I think maybe I'm more dangerous than ever is we have to play all the cards. And playing all the cards means we start with our own privilege and we are privileged. Mm. And so use it. And I've tried to use my privilege and my influence, wherever it may be, small or large, to advance the stories and ideas of other women. Not as some philanthropic notion, but because I believe it changes the world. And if we ever had any doubts about that, all you have to do now is look at the women who are leading countries around the world. We are doing better. They are doing better uh, in this time of, of challenge and COVID because of the leadership skills of women. And when you look at Acumen and you look at the women entrepreneurs, who they pivoted, as you said, so quickly to find solutions. We have in eight really important qualities that make us ideally suited for leadership. Not all of us, we're not monolithic, but believing in that, um, I suppose is the first step. And I've always believed in it. I've always believed that always believed I wasn't it. making opportunities for other women because it was a good thing to do. It was the right thing to do for the company, the country, the government, uh, the world. Pat, it's such a beautiful note to end on. And just to reinforce, you know, what you talked about, that it actually, it does come down to values and, um, and the way that you have lived from that place is what gives you such sparkle and meaning. And, um, and I actually think that 
while Acumen's hundred and you know fifty some odd country, uh, companies across our suite of philanthropic back funds and for profit funds through our academy, our, our university for social change, that that we've actually become a laboratory that has taught me that it is possible to solve all of our problems, but we have to start by redefining success. Um, for too long, we've defined it as money, power, and fame. And, and now we're at a situation where we are too divided, too divisive, and unsustainably unequal and environmentally in possibly catastrophic territory. The only way we move through this is to redefine it in ways that put our shared humanity and the sustainability of the earth at the center of all of our systems. And that starts with our economic system, not just profit. I do think that, that the extraordinary entrepreneurs and, and individual in leaders, and that includes the philanthropists that support this work, are testament to the fact that not only can you build those kinds of solutions, but you can build a community that is deeply diverse across race, class, ethnicity, religion, and ideology, because we start to recognize, as you said, that we are in this together, that we see ourselves in each other, and that we understand finally that we don't get dignity as a human race until every one of us gets dignity. And so um, I just thank you, Pat, for all that you have taught me. Um, for keeping me focused on the policies that come from the work that we do on the economic side and, um, and for being a storyteller. And, um, and again, thank you to everyone listening, to Angela, your team, Visionary Women, and, um, and our teams too. Thank you, Jacqueline. It was a privilege. It was a privilege. Visionary Women is a unique nonprofit community that's dedicated to supporting and funding high impact initiatives for women and girls. To learn more, go to visionarywomen.com and find out how you can join us. Your donation will make an impact on the lives of women and girls everywhere.